Maar we kunnen ook daar naar het steeksblok gaan. Heb je dat aangekomen? Ja, omdat ik al wist dat dit aan zou gaan komen. Check. Good. Yeah, yes. Good. Do you want to put the mic as close? Where am I looking? Good afternoon and welcome to Kunst Institute Melli and today's live streamed program, the forum Altered States. I'm Vivian Zahel, Research and Program Manager, and I'm joined here by Sarah Shin, who's the founder of Ignota Books uh, and with whom we are co-presenting this program. This morning we've enjoyed a program of talks, body workshops, uh, uh, sonic uh, immersions and infused foods. Uh, all hosted in the galleries of our 84 Steps exhibition and experimental clinic. And we would like to thank our guests, Kairani Baraka, Clay A.D., Kautau Gadir, uh, Hugh Lemmy, Lena Longafe and Alejandra Lopez, and Nisha Ramaya and MJ Harding for all of those wonderful presentations, um, and for being our live audience here in the auditorium. Uh, a special thank you also, of course, to Jesse Koyman, uh, the curator of Collective Learning, uh, who has co-organized this program as well. 84 Steps is a long-term platform on our third floor that is dedicated to explore the relations of mental health and access in the context of physical and social architectures. It's inspired by our own building, which was established in 1870 as a school for girls and with an architecture that was influenced by cholera and tuberculosis epidemics of the time. The school was established at the same time as our street, the Vida de Vitstraat, from which we have renamed uh, this January. In the research behind the exhibition, there was a footnote by the uh, writer and anti-psychiatrist R.D. Lang, in which he made the simple observation that the modern view of psychiatry came into being when the demonological point of view gave way 300 years ago to a clinical viewpoint. And so this raises the obvious question uh, of what happened to the demons or the angels. Did they simply disappear? Or do they haunt our worlds at the edges of awareness? Or put another way around, uh, what has happened to certain kinds of cognitive possibility in the cultivation of a psyche that is well suited to survive in modern mass commercial systems? So these threads have been explored uh, since the opening of the exhibition through weekly trainings that are held within the galleries and led by our colleagues Akene Wilson and Veronica Babayan. Uh, and in coming to study these in a forum, uh, we reached out to Ignota Books, whose publishing and events programs lead us to contemplate what happens when worlds of spirit uh, meet in the unfolding of, of colonial modernity. 
So we found many common interests uh, and a very lively interlocutor with Ignota Books. And our program coincides with the launch of their new poetry anthology, Altered States. So Sarah, perhaps could you give us an introduction to this wonderful new book? Thank you, Vivian. Um, beginning, just to begin with, a huge thank you for your generous and generative and really receptive collaboration. It's been a pleasure. Um, so regarding altered states, um, I'll try and be quick, I guess. Um, Vivian approached us with this quotation from Adi Lang, which was really exciting because it pointed towards the conversations between medicine, madness and magic that we were thinking of in relation to altered states. Um, altered states is a book of questions. It asks, what are altered states of consciousness? Um, can altered states produce altered worlds? Um, and an implicit question of what is alterity. So the poems and the poetic pieces gathered in the book, they kind of explore grief and AI and plant allies, more than human ontologies, uh, mushrooms, um, panpsychism. And through writing, the poets and the contributors, they explore, um, they come back and tell us something of what the other side is so that we might be shown something of what this side is. Um, so that perhaps every circumstance could be an opportunity for being otherwise. And put in another way, you could say that it's maybe something about giving angels and demons a home. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, thank you. So we're going to move um, quite swiftly through the evening or the afternoon's program. Uh, and a huge uh, debt of thanks must be given to our technical team who've worked um, tirelessly and in a very dedicated fashion to reformat uh, this program. Uh, Yuri Lovin, Aline uh, Kramer, uh, Ryan uh, Kems, uh, and uh, among others. And uh, so the first part of the program uh, will be a choral performance by Cora uh, Schmeiser, followed by an image lecture uh, by a for Steps artist uh, Lisa Tan. So just a few quick words. Um, uh, Cora Schmeiser is a, a foremost interpreter of the music compositions of Van uh, Bingen. She was born in Mainz, which is the same region where Hildegard uh, lived. And Cora feels very connected to the work of this extraordinary personality from another century. Uh, one of the programs in the earlier part of our um, sessions today uh, spoke about the visions of um, Van Bingen as well as of uh, another uh, early medieval mystic Kemp, uh, and one of the points of, or one of the things that came through that talk was that vision is, is almost not the fully apt word because the nature of them was to be fully uh, embodied uh, realities almost with sense, with taste, with sort of physical uh, experiences. So we're very happy to at least in this session uh, enjoy some of the sonic uh, elements of, of Hildegard's work, and Cora herself will say some more words on this. Thank you.
first antiphon by Hildegard von Bingen, O Viriditas Virga, which is dedicated to uh, Mary, Saint Mary, um, but she is very much described in nature how she grows like a, uh, like a tree and she brings flowers forth and she gives all what the, the earth can give us. So she brings all the sounds and chants um, to us and so that we can feel many joy inside and, um, and understand that we are in connection with the whole world and the whole cosmos. Um, I think for Hildegard from Bingen, maybe music was of course a language also to connect emotions and the, the state of the soul with her language, with the language of music, but also her own texts, also inventing her own language, which was already spoken of before, of course. And that is the reason why I also chose a piece where she still uses some of those words. Uh, and she's describing the church, the church being um, a bigger state of bringing physical but also uh, intellectual um, ideas together and describing them as a big gem after all, giving us all the splendor we want. Mm. with the thir third um, responsorium by Hildegard von Bingen. Here um, she is describing the energy of the green, <laughs> the viriditas, um, but she's describing it as the green finger of God and how stable 
um, the, um, the, the goddess, goddess is um, in showing up in a column of light and um, uh, sh showing how, um, how the glands should be and how we will develop in this state of all the elements and the between earth and heaven.
Program. If it was another, if it was another point of history, I would give you a very big hug. That was a, a really beautiful performance. So, uh, for those uh, joining us online, we're having a bit of a changement in the space as we uh, close some curtains. So that will be the background noise that you're picking up from us, uh, and we're doing that because we're preparing for the second part in our program. Uh, of course, the third part culminates with. Uh, a keynote lecture uh, by poet and essayist Anne Boyer, which will have a Q&A with uh, poet Mia Yu. Uh, but between now and then, we get to enjoy a image lecture. Uh, and it is being contributed by an artist, uh, Lisa Tan, who is exhibiting at the moment within 84 Steps uh, with two wonderful uh, room-sized installations uh, that recreate the waiting rooms of um, uh, psychological and, and neuropsychological uh, specialists. So this uh, image lecture is its new work. Uh, it emerges from and is in relation to those installations, but uh, takes the questions a little bit further. It's called uh, Dodge and Burn. Um, and in the image lecture, through a series of evasions, uh, Tan traces how an image uh, refuses capture and in that way reveals more in its absence. It traces a personal and world political experience uh, and reaches for the role of images in a time of visual and information overload, sensing how forms of violence are ever more frequently self-inflicted under prevailing structures, including the condition of burnout troubling the established limits of, of representation. So um, it has been a real pleasure to be working with Lisa uh, through this exhibition uh, and in relation to this forum. And are we set? Yes. Okay. So uh, please enjoy. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes okay. I always like to know how long things are. Um, this is really switching gears, and it's uh, 19 minutes long. Prologue. I don't remember when exactly, but many years ago, I was on a flight to Los Angeles that landed in darkness on the 4th of July, when fireworks explode in the sky to celebrate the independence of the United States from British rule. It is different and amazing to see fireworks from above and the ground below. It looks like war. Los Angeles International Airport is only two kilometers away from the coast. All flights destined for this airport head in the direction of the Pacific Ocean, eventually flying over the neighborhoods of South Los Angeles and Inglewood moments before touching down on the runway. Planes from the north turn east and then curve west over downtown Los Angeles. Planes from the south turn left to line up with the flight path. From the west, they fly parallel to the runway until it's time to make a full U-turn. And planes from the east maintain an elegant, straight line. In the final descent, all arriving flights queue directly above neighborhoods where the militarization of the police was actively developed. A reaction to the expressive public gatherings of citizens in 1965 against housing discrimination and police violence. Four years later, the first SWAT team was deployed for a raid on the Black Panther Party. 
As my flight approached the runway, the grid of the city drew near, and I saw smaller fireworks set off from sidewalks and backyards. Yet I couldn't hear people celebrating. I couldn't hear the screech that fireworks, fireworks make as they launch, or the low rumble when they explode. I just heard the plane's ventilation system as if it was what circulated the scene's darker ontology. I decided that one day, when it made sense, I'd return to the scene to film it. Like an amateur astronomer, I'd make plans for a once-in-a-generation comet. The image should be recorded from a commercial airplane, not from a hired helicopter, not with a drone, but in the seat of routine, everyday commercial flight. Come the summer of 2017, it was time, but I realized it too late and it'd have to wait another year. I've now tried to film the scene for three consecutive years, and each time I have failed for distinctly different reasons, but through its evasion, another image of violence has revealed itself. Are not permitted village in the seatbelt pockets, please. We'll be coming through the cabin to collect any last minute rubbish items, including anything in your seatbelt pocket. Thanks very much for keeping us company on this sunset ride to Los Angeles. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night. On the 4th of July, 2018, I returned to Los Angeles to try to film the scene I witnessed long ago. I fly to San Francisco in the middle of the day and return to Los Angeles as night falls. I am exhausted. I have a deep fatigue that no amount of sleep can help, yet the only desire I have is to sleep. By two o'clock each day, forming complete sentences takes great effort. I'm unable to find even simple words. I can't read a full paragraph without getting lost. It's been like this for several years now. My intellect can't keep up with what touches me. I work too much, but so do a lot of people. I need to press stop, but I don't, or I'm unwilling to, and I'm not alone. Directly before arriving to Los Angeles, I lead a group of 19 art students from Sweden on an educational trip. We travel from Stockholm, which is where I live, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, the first point of entry. From there, we drive north to Santa Fe, and then further north to a village called Abiquiu, which is where Georgie O'Keefe kept a home and studio. After that, we head 915 kilometers south to Donald Judd's Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas. We visit geological wonders and Walmarts. We read and discuss texts by Paul Chat Smith, Lucy Lippard, Robert Irwin, the short stories of Lucia Berlin, who lived in both Albuquerque and El Paso, cities also featured on our big adventure. And although it's very satisfying to see students creating strong bonds to art and its inquiries and to each other, I am so lost in fatigue by the time we part ways. Yet I'm still determined to film my shot of the 4th of July. I follow through with my plan, 
which revolves around finding the optimum arrival time to Los Angeles International Airport. The darker the night sky is, the noisier my image will be, but if it's too bright, there won't be any fireworks. I also buy a ticket for my friend, Cinziana. She's agreed to be my second camera, my backup. We leave in the morning for San Francisco. We spend a few hours in Golden Gate Park until it's time to head back to the airport. On the return flight, Cinziana sits on the right side of the plane, in the back, away from the wing. I sit on the left side, in the front of the plane. A dead heading pilot takes the seat next to me. He looks like a caricature from the 1950s, all smiles and wax-like. The sky is clear as we fly south. We fly over the Central Valley of California. I test and address my camera. We pass Santa Barbara. Around Malibu, I film a sequence. It looks great. I start filming again directly after we pass the Getty Center in Brentwood. We curve around downtown Los Angeles and head towards the airport. Fireworks are exploding as if in slow motion. The light is ideal. It's sublime. It looks again like a war zone, both beautiful and disturbing. We touch down and I press stop, or I think I'm pressing stop, but my camera starts filming. I've totally fucked up. My head falls into my hands. Cinziana has the shot though. She texts me from the back of the plane, excited. But when she later uploads the footage, she sees how the camera that she rented was incompatible with the lens that she used. The shoot is a total failure. I was tired, I was tired. I pressed stop instead of record. July 4th, 2019. Cinziana and I head up to San Francisco from Los Angeles. We see a Suzanne Lacey show at SF MoMA, and then we Uber back to the airport to make our flight. On the 4th of July, the sun sets Los Angeles at 8.08 .08 p.m. The flight is scheduled to arrive LAX at 8.45 p.m. Even if we land up to 20 minutes early, the shot will still work. Again, I sit in the front of the plane. Cinziana is in the back. The person seated next to me takes a picture of a small dog in the aisle in front of us. It's obviously an emotional support animal. We start talking about the cute dog. She is chatty in that American way that I've come to miss. She openly tells me what she does for a living. She's a cuddle therapist a profession I'm not sure exists in many places beyond the United States, and even there, it's a relatively new phenomenon. If you're not familiar, a cuddle therapist is a person who someone hires to hold them. I ask her every question I can think of. How did you get into this line of work? How long is each session? How old are your clients? How do you get your clients? Her answer to this last question stuns me. She tells me that her clients find her by word of mouth. I try to imagine the circumstances that would lead to one person telling another person 
about someone they can hire to hold them. My seat neighbor explains how many of her clients are young men who work in the tech industry. All they do is work. They have money, porn takes care of sex. They might have families in faraway places. They long to be touched in a way that makes them feel cared for by another human being. I could talk to her for hours more, but I end our conversation and I set the focus on my camera for the scene below, even though at this point I already know that I will fail for a second time. The plane lands at 8 p.m., 45 minutes earlier. It's way too bright, an explosion here and there, nothing I can use. But it's then that I start to connect what I'm doing to another kind of violence, one that is softer, invisible, and perhaps self-inflicted. Part three, July 4th, 2020. By the summer of this year, things have drastically changed. For some, the coronavirus turns out to be a respite, a chance to decelerate. For others, it becomes one long waking nightmare. The fear and anxiety is palpable during the first wave of the pandemic, but I need to travel from Stockholm to El Paso, where my mother is. She's sold the house that she's lived in for 40 years and needs my help to move to another city. By the time I arrive, 100,000 people in the US have died from the virus. Black Lives Matter protests span the country and beyond. Stores are boarded up. It's an election year of extraordinary consequence. Three million more guns than usual have been sold. I arrive, self-quarantine, move my mother, and get her situated. I then make my way to Los Angeles. I cannot ask Cinziana to risk infection from the flight, nor anybody else, so I book a seat for one. This time, I don't leave the airport. I just wait there until it's flight time to fly back to LA. I, can, I sit behind a young couple but I can hear them talk about breaking up. One of them is openly crying, so I move to give them space. I stand instead next to the gate and wait for the pilots. When I see one of them, I ask him if he can land the plane as close as possible to the scheduled time. Please, not earlier. I explain how I'm on this flight to film the fireworks. He tells me that he'll try, but once we get into LA airspace, He'll have to do what air traffic control tells him to. In the air, I can sense that we're going more slowly. It's getting dark in good time. My camera is ready. There are reports of much higher than usual sales of illegal fireworks. Fireworks have been exploding in Los Angeles late at night since June. Uninterrupted sleep is hard to come by. Theories circulate that it's a right-wing strategy to unnerve Black Lives Matter protesters. As we get closer to Los Angeles, the plane continues to fly next to the ocean. We're supposed to turn left to line up with a flight path over the South Central and Inglewood, but we keep flying south and parallel to the shore. I can see fireworks in the distance and the light is perfect. The plane lands without taking the usual route. It's another failure. As we deplane, the pilot finds me to tell me that ours is the first flight of the night, and perha perhaps the first ever, to be diverted because of the fireworks. They are so intense that it's dangerous. I drive away from the airport into total chaos. 
It's as if a war is raging as I head up the 110 freeway that bisects South Los Angeles. The explosions dissipate after downtown, and as I continue in the direction of Hollywood, into neighborhoods with higher income brackets. The next day, an acrid yellow haze blankets the entire city. Authorities say that the pollution from the fireworks is hazardous. People are advised to stay inside with the windows closed. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, yeah, for that really meticulously prepared and, and very depthful meditation on, on failure and on what failure means within, you know, a system of mass, uh, yeah, that, that massively produces harm. Uh, and the, rela yeah, the relation between um, the moment of an explosion and, and the slow uh, wear and tear of, of burnout. So thank you. Uh, we will now, yeah, you're tuned to uh, Kunst Institut Melli. If you're with us online, I should recap who and where we are. Uh, this is a forum uh, called Altered States. It's uh, co-presented uh, with Ignota Books on the occasion of our exhibition, 84 Steps. Uh, we are going to have a brief pause now uh, for about five minutes, after which we will be back for a keynote lecture uh, by poet an essayist and a Pulitzer Prize winner, Anne Boyer, uh, or Boyer, sorry. And um, uh, that will be moderated uh, with a Q&A by Mia Yu, and we're very happy to be presenting that lecture as well, together with Stichting Perdue uh, Poetry House in Amsterdam. So uh, we'll be back in five minutes. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> 